Hello. <laughs> I know I'm the last thing standing between you and lunch. So I'll try to make sure that I keep uh, the time so that we end at 12 o'clock, if not earlier. Thank you for having me today at the National Data Science Workshop. A little bit about me. I'm, a, I'm the newest assistant teaching professor actually on campus. Uh, so I'm technically, yeah, woo. so I'm, <laughs> I'm part of the electrical engineering and computer science departments. And well, as you can see, I'm very, very young. And, you know, <laughs> if we think about data science, actually, I learned all of my data science through three computing degrees from my bachelor's to my master's to my PhD. So that was like a really long stretch of at least 10 years. But now all of this data science knowledge has actually been pushed into one semester long class that has been running at UC Berkeley for at least five years, if not more. Undergraduates mid degree, so in their sophomore, junior years, sometimes even their senior year can actually apply industry level tools and thinking to all of their things that they're going through in their courses, in their internships, in their research, and so on. And that single course is Data 100. So if I think a little bit about this name, principles and techniques of data science, what does that allow students to do? Well, we can talk about the learning goals a little bit. And I like to categorize them into like prepare, enable, and empower. And I'll talk about each of these uh, separately. So preparing, well, Data 100 prepares students for advanced courses in data management, machine learning, and statistics, all the things that you heard from John in the morning. Data 100, because it involves real world tools as well as real world data, enables students to start careers as data scientists and researchers with this experience. And then finally, empowering. If we're working with real world data, we're gonna be working to try and solve real world problems. And therefore by allowing students to actually apply their computational and inferential thinking to these problems, we actually prepare them for their future as well. I'm going to do a little remix of John's uh, presentation on the data science courses and the majors and the minors uh, from this morning to talk a little bit about the lower division where data 100 lies and also what happens after data 100. So if we think about the lower division, the one course that all students have to take is data eight, and then all the other content can be taken from different courses. There's like a CS course for computational structures. There's a data course for computational structures, so on and so forth. So everyone takes data eight as part of the major and the minor. At the early upper division level, so thinking about it as kind of the thing that sandwiches between uh, the lower division and also these applied topics are data 100, probability, and human context and ethics of data. So we can kind of see that data eight and data 100 are the course numbers that students have to take as either part of the major or part of the minor. And actually this is path one that I put up here, but for path two of the data science minor as well, they also have to take data 100 and data eight. Yeah, there's a question in the audience. Yeah, fantastic question. So thankfully my slides actually show this. So the question was, hey, so what are the prerequisites of data 100? It's data eight. It's also a CS1 type of like an introductory computer uh, computational structures. Again, this is usually in the CS department, but it's also in, in data. And then calculus and linear algebra. And as John mentioned this, mo uh, this morning at, at UC Berkeley, the current linear algebra course has a prerequisite of calculus. So students are coming in with this mathematical and computational and data science background before they come into data 100. Let's talk a little bit about the course design and where some of the foundations and some of the ideas are coming from. They're coming from a lot of data eight. So again, with this prerequisite of data eight, that means that students have a common knowledge and a common language to talk about data with. And the first thing we do is we introduce them to the data science life cycle. So as many of you may be familiar, this is the data science life cycle, but if you're not, I'll talk about it a little bit. So this, it's this idea that as we work with data, we can either start with data that we have collected or that we have received from another source. We can talk about a question of problem that we would like to get and then collect data and then move towards exploring the data, analyzing the data, modeling the data, predicting, inf inferring from the data, and then finally presenting and reporting and deciding and finding solutions from the data. Now, as Ari mentioned earlier, there's a modified version, or excuse me, Anyway, as, as previous uh, speakers had talked about earlier, there's a modified version of the data science life cycle, which involves uh, the data science ethos life cycle. That's kind of like a future version of data 100 that we haven't implemented yet. So we're just gonna work with this four step uh, version for now. 
But Data 100's focus in this life cycle is to teach students how to think about the computational and statistical tools that they would need for this primary part of the life cycle here. So we kind of provide students with the question of the problem, we provide students with the data, but that's real world data, that's a real world problem, and then students learn these tools, both mathematically and through coding. So let's talk about some foundational tools. As you may have seen from uh, the Data 8 workshop or the, the Data 8 bootcamp from yesterday, Data 8 really focuses on both using Python and the Jupyter Notebook in the context of what's called the Data Science Library, which does a lot of things for the student. Now, since we're trying to uh, build students towards industry level tools, from, data science, from this Data Science Library, we actually teach students how to use Pandas, uh, which is a Python library. And then we also introduced SQL, which is further expanded in a, data, in a new data engineering class that we won't have time to talk about today. Now note that Jupyter is still part of this. So students are using the same infrastructure to learn all of these tools, but then now they build from a education specific data science library to these types of tools with lots of documentation, lots of different functions, and then try to build fluency in that. Now, if we think about visualization, and so the reason why I highlighted the data science life cycle here is that it, it involves exploring and analyzing the data as well as presenting the data to other people. Again, the data science library in Data8 does all of this. However, in the real world, at least in Python, uh, there's going to be different types of tools, so including uh, Matplotlib and Seaborn, which is what we mainly focus on, but we also demonstrate the use of Plotly, which is a more interactive type of graphing library that is used commonly um, by scientists to kind of talk amongst each other and display this data. And then from this, the students actually build more advanced visualizations than what they see in data eight. So we talk a little bit about bar and violin plots, for example. We talk about how to customize plots so that, that they can overlay histograms and do this type of uh, analysis. We talk about kernel density estimates, so how to smooth data that they see. And then we talk about our principal component analysis, so a way to figure out like from high dimensional data, how we could actually visualize it as well as analyze and understand what's important about the data. Yeah, there's a question in the back. Yeah, good question. So the question is, uh, so to what extent do we talk about the mathematics of kernel density estimates in PCA? We talk about it a little bit. So again, uh, remember that the uh, requirements for the class, I go all the way back here, are linear algebra and calculus. So actually, as part of our linear algebra class, the students already see the mathematical foundation of what's called singular value decomposition. So they see that proof already. And then now we're showing the, them the application of that, which is called PCA. Yeah, and for kernel density estimates, we do actually teach that, but they don't actually learn Gaussian, like this normal distribution until their probability class later. So it's kind of like, we, we build on what they know and then, and then they, they, they continue from there. Yeah, good question. Now, the last part of this prediction and inference, I'm gonna talk about in two, uh, in two slides. One of them is coming from data eight, there's different ways to do modeling. However, we kind of expand this to uh, SciPy, so from NumPy to SciPy, and then also uh, FKLearn, which is used a lot in, uh, in research in machine learning. So what do they do with this, uh, with this information? Well, they look at data eight one more time. So they do like kind of a data eight redux of least squares regression, linear regression, and they, and they fully understand some of the mathematics and behind that derivation. I'll show that in a bit. They also learn classification. So in data eight, there's a little tiny bit of classification, but not with any sort of, uh, I mean, it's, they do nearest neighbors types of things. And then in data 100, they do things like logistic regression. And then they also understand how to use uh, decision trees using SK Learn's uh, Python library. And then finally, there's an introduction to clustering. So this idea of uh, unsupervised learning there as well. Now, one thing to think about is uh, when we think about data acquisition and exploratory data analysis, and then we think about using this with real, real world data, the thing that I didn't talk about in the data science life cycle is that there's actually a loop in the life cycle. So for those of you who have uh, maybe gone through some, some of your own data science projects, it turns out that real world data is quite messy. So therefore you could collect data and then you have to kind of like clean it a little bit and then look at it and then clean it a little bit more. Here's an example uh, that we use in Data 100. We look at uh, San Francisco's uh, public health data repository, where they actually uh, publish all of the uh, restaurant, um, the restaurant uh, cleaning, uh, cleanliness scores when they when they go do their inspections. And as you can see, when the students look at this data the first time, 
Well, there's like a whole bunch of negative numbers for latitude and longitude and for phone numbers. So as they explore the data, as they try to visualize this and categorize this and all of this, they'll have to deal with these numbers and, and plug in or interpolate or impute these, uh, these entries. And so to teach them the skills for data wrangling, we teach regular expressions. And so that's from a computing uh, perspective. We teach missing values and in interpolation and canonicalization. I'll talk a little. Your default microphone has changed to microphone array. It's changed back. Now back to modeling for a little bit. <laughs> now back to modeling for a little bit. When we think about modeling, is it good? Is it? It's not, it's fine. Keep going. All right, cool. <laughs> thank you. Um, so when we talk about modeling, it's not just the types of models that they can use, but it's how they use those models. And so in SK Learn, or actually when you're thinking about being, becoming a machine learning, uh, machine learning researcher or a scientist, then you have to consider, well, how can we actually measure and balance the amount of data that we're given with the type of model that we want to train? So we do things like cross-validation, we do things like gradient descent, so trying to iteratively uh, go through that model. How does the solver actually work? And then we also consider things like the model uh, bias variance trade-off. Essential to this, though, is indeed a little bit of probability. And so because probability is not uh, a strict prerequisite of this course, in fact, it's not even a prerequisite of this course, we do have to introduce some concepts of statistics, sample statistics, parameters, estimation, and all of these types of things. So we do introduce a little bit of that to be able to reach these engineering practices and to be able to apply them effectively. The last a note for uh, course design is here's a typical week in data 100. So uh, it works very similar to uh, a lot of our classes here at UC Berkeley, which is that there are two live lectures or three, um, but in, in previous semesters, it's been two uh, live lectures, Tuesdays and Thursdays, as well as a smaller discussion section of about 20, uh, 20 to 25 students. Those are the learning times where students are actively in a room. And then we also have uh, labs where students kind of start to interact with the tools and try it out in a type of tutorial or a slightly open-ended fashion. And then finally, there's a homework due every week. And that's kind of like the bulk of where students will actually dive into a lot of the real world data that's presented along with the topic. Let me show you some of these uh, facets that I, sh uh, that I uh, displayed on the previous table. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we translate um, data eight to data 100 and all of these different these different topics. So let's talk about least squares regression. And there's going to be a good amount of math in this slide. So I'm just going to like, you know, high level categorization, but I just wanted to warn people ahead of time that you don't have to fully understand the math. It's just kind of here. And then I'll explain the high level goals. So in data eight, what you saw from uh, Monday's boot camp is that when you think about slope and you think about linear regression, we use these words and phrases to intuitively teach the students how, it, like, how the variable X is related to the variable Y and how you would compute the slope and how you would compute the intercept. Now in data 100, what we do is not only do we move from uh, this English and mathematical complex fusion of equations to a fully mathematical uh, language, but we also introduce this concept of multidimensionality of linear models. So now we move to matrix, matrix multiplication because students have seen that in linear algebra. We can do more matrix operations. So we can, we can actually introduce the normal equation now and we can consider uh, different vectors and, and inverses and all this, this stuff. And then finally, instead of just deriving things and saying, oh yeah, visually this line looks like it fits. Now we can actually say, well, this line fits because we're trying to minimize this particular objective function or optimization function. And so actually as part of data 100, not only do students see this derivation in class, but they also apply it in homework and actually do a few proofs to kind of double check for themselves that these uh, mathematical properties hold true. So you can kind of see how we introduce these, these ideas in data eight so students build the intuition. And then now with data 100, they actually have the power to expand beyond that. Here's another example. So uh, I, I believe the bootcamp uh, yesterday talked a little bit about nonlinearity and we talked about, uh, and it talked a little bit about this thing called residuals. So if we consider uh, the length of dugongs and how it predicts their age, then we could slap a line onto the graph. However, what data eight tells you 
is that if you look at the residual plot, ideally, a good residual plot should show no pattern. However, this plot clearly shows a pattern. So this is not a good linear fit. And this is where data eight stops. Okay, so kind of like showing the limitations of what we can do with linear models. Data 100 goes one step further. So this is the same graph uh, from the previous slide and says, well, let's try to actually engineer the better fit because maybe we do actually want a model that can predict dugong uh, ages based on their length, or we would like to infer something and truly understand whether this model works well. By engineering this, we could take the log of the age and it turns out that it is a linear fit with respect to the log of age. And then students can transform this back and plot things using, uh, using matplotlib and scipy and all of these, these types of uh, computational tools. Okay, so if you kind of see how like data 100 does indeed go one step further and not only goes one step further, but also moves away from this data science library towards industrial tools. Yeah, there's a question in the back. Um, I know that data 100 has Right. But I think this means that either one of those will type Oh, great question. Great question. Um, Sorry, yeah, I think about yeah. Uh, so are you teaching basically all of those different, I forget what they're called, matplotlib, what are they called? Uh, library, libraries or modules? Yeah, depends. Are you teaching those within data one of or are those data? Great question. Great question. So the question is, hey, uh, where is Python in the prerequisites? And then also, um, what about those tools? Uh, what about those Python tools like the packages and the libraries? Where is that being taught? Um, so actually, if we go back to the prerequisites slides, which is what I'm pulling up right here, um, you'll see that there is actually just one computational uh, structures prerequisite class. However, there's also data eight which for a lot of students actually does serve as their first exposure to programming. And then they take computational structures before they take uh, the data 100 class. So in both of these courses, uh, at least for the prerequisites that we have, I think both of them are in Python. So data is definitely in Python. And then I believe this CS1 computational structures class for most of the options that are available are also in Python. And so they have a lot of familiarity with Python, but you're right that there is no familiarity with pandas or SciPy or sklearn and all of these things. So actually students at this point in data 100, they learn all those tools for the first time. Okay. Yeah, 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 good question. Okay, there's another question here, yeah. Sorry, say that again? Oh yes, good question. Uh, so this is, a, this is a four unit course for undergraduates. Yeah, and so you can kind of see that based on the, um, the commitment of the schedule, which is quite similar uh, to the data aid commitment. So I apologize, I'm kind of skipping around a little bit. Yeah, so just based on uh, based on the classroom time as well as the work time, this is indeed a four unit course. Um, graduate students can, uh, I believe, also have to take a for four units, but we're trying to adjust that uh, based on the workload. Yeah, good question. Okay, so we saw the dugongs. <laughs> let me let me show you a little bit of the real world examples. Um, well, rather, I'll show you where the data sets come from for each of these homeworks. So as students are learning these tools, they immediately work with real data. So that public health data, those, those restaurant inspection scores that you saw earlier, they start with the homework two with that information, and they try to clean and explore that data itself. Then homework three, when they're learning regular expressions, they do text analysis via Twitter and kind of see, okay, well, why are these uh, popular Twitter people tweeting at different times? like eight hours later than the other popular Twitter people. And it turns out, well, maybe they're actually on a different coast, they're in a different country, right? So kind of just understanding all these different constraints that were not fully taught in data eight, hinted at, but not fully taught. And then now students are actually uh, bringing that to the surface. We also deal with bike sharing. So more visualization, more EDA, as they learn these uh, new tools like Matplotlib and Plotly and all of that. And then finally, there's a lot more data sets that we pull from. Many of these are actually from Kaggle. So that's a, a larger machine learning data set. And we try to keep our data sets open source. Um, so then that way, if, the, if there's any updates that happen, we can just kind of push it in uh, and students can have access. So yeah, we, look, we work with polling data, um, IMDB, also like New York Taxis is a common data set in Kaggle as well. Uh, here's a classic one. So, uh, oh yeah, oh, there's a question. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, good question. So how much do the homeworks change? Um, data 100 is also doing its best to be stable. 
um, doing its best is I think the key word here. So a lot of these homeworks, um, I believe some of them have been in operation for a few years, um, but we're always trying to change them. And I think um, I alluded to trying to adjust some of the data science lifecycle earlier. We're trying to make sure that, I mean, if you see a lot of this data that we're using here, it is from the uh, kind of like the tech industry. And then we're trying, trying to be able to actually address some of the impacts that looking at this data may have. So that is like kind of future work that we're looking at. Yeah. Do you have any problems with academic dishonesty then? Do you have any problems with academic dishonesty? Fantastic question. Yes, of course. I think every class would have this. Yeah, but I mean, and that's also that's also a challenge for data eight as well. And I think we can have a larger discussion about how we're trying to mitigate that and how maybe the auto grader can kind of involve uh, can be involved here. Yeah, good question. Rock on. One more question. Yeah. Sorry, and if I could go back, <laughs> is there is there a point where you start to talk to the students about the nature of Good question. So the question is, uh, hey, uh, what do you do in terms of the statistical uh, mental model? Is it a frequency approach? Is it a Bayesian approach? Is it approximation? How do we do all these things? Because we're coming from a data eight type of standpoint, which uses, let's say, bootstrapping and does hypothesis testing and simulation, that's where we try to ground a lot of our statistical understanding. And then there is a probability course that is not a prerequisite of this course, 140, which I don't think is talked about um, in the workshop this time around, unfortunately. 140 compares both of these models, the frequentist and the Bayesian model. And then uh, there's a inferential decisions, and that one is more Bayesian, um, almost by virtue of how the, the course was, was constructed. Yeah. We don't get into those details. And I mean, as you can see, like if students are learning these computational tools for the first time, seeing probability for the first time, adding on this layer of like, okay, well, by the way, there was two different stories. And now we're going to tell you both of them at the same time. It's a little bit much. And so, but you're totally right that I think there are many different approaches that we could have taken here. And I think the thing that we really want to focus on is that this class comes after data eight. So what kind of knowledge will students have and how can we build on that? Yeah, good question. Cool. Okay. All right. Last few slides here. So uh, one of the big projects that we have for this course, so in addition to weekly homeworks, sometimes there's a bigger weekly homework, like a two-part weekly homework, and those, that's what we call projects in this course, is the classic spam ham email classifier. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with this phrasing, spam is email spam, and then ham is non-spam email, but kind of alluding back to what people were saying about things being stem and non-stem, instead of saying non-spam, we say ham. Kind of thinking about what spam <laughs> relates to. Anyway, so if we think about spam ham classifier, we're actually dealing with this idea of logistic regression and dealing with actually what it what does it mean to build a classifier and how can we measure the effectiveness or performance of this classifier? So students engineer a model. For example, how did you find the features? How did you engineer the features for your model using all the tools that we provided to you? What did you try that worked or didn't work? Trying to like kind of encourage students to really reflect on the types of engineering practices that they did. And then finally, what was surprising in your, in your search for good features? Then once they build the model, built the model, then we asked them to think about the metrics that they were using to find, quote, the best model. So how do we contrast evaluation metrics? Name one reason why this classifier is performing poorly. So kind of diving deeper into a lot of those engineering questions that we're asking earlier. And then uh, like which of these two classifiers we kind of present two of them, would you prefer uh, for a stand filter and why? Okay, so try, try, again, trying to think about design on a, on a higher level as well. So a few reflections and I'll close. Uh, one of them is course sustainability. So as, as you may expect, this course is actually quite big, um, but I will talk about that in one slide. The slides are slightly out of order. This is a little bit of cherry picked feedback, but you know, bear with me. <laughs> Uh, I honestly would consider this class the most useful class that I've taken here at Berkeley. I really appreciate how applicable this class was to just about everything, smiley face. I really enjoyed the course, and I feel like it is probably one of the most applicable classes I have taken at Cal. So I've bolded things for emphasis, but you can kind of see the applications are key to Data 100. What else is key to Data 100? Where it lies in the major and in a lot of the degree programs. I was definitely already thinking about it, but Data 100 firmly convinced me to pursue a data science minor. Please continue offering such incredible courses in the future, especially on the graduate level. Data 100 is actually what we call a mezzanine course. So it's cross-listed not only across a lot of departments, but it's also cross-listed in undergraduate and graduate programs as well. 
back to the statistics. So uh, this is a graph of the number of students over time. So this uh, class was first offered in spring 2017 to about a little bit less than 100 students. And over time, uh, spring 22, this most recent semester was 1,005 students, 893 undergrads, 112 graduate students. Pretty big if I would say so myself. So how do we make sure that teachers and students are actually talking to each other? And the success is one of the successes of our CDSS program here, which is teaching assistants, teaching assistants, teaching assistants, mm -hmm. and also passionate teaching assistants and ones that truly understand the material and care about teaching overall. So we have a very large teaching staff to be able to run these uh, 20, 20 person discussion sections every single week. There's labs as well. There's daily office hours throughout all weekdays, usually late into the night. We, students, uh, actually our, our TAs even volunteer to be able to say, okay, well, we actually wanna spend some of our time developing review sessions for the exams in this course. So how can we book those rooms? How can we make sure that we can record and be able to access and, and give this knowledge to all of the students and opportunities? And then finally, there's an online class forum Ed, uh, who will have a session on Friday, I believe, about their uh, Jupyter platform. Here's some quotes about the passion of the teaching staff. This class is very full of content and the staff are so supportive during discussion and on ed. Thank you, for, thank you all for this semester. Data science staff is the best among UC Berkeley courses. So again, the reputation of CDSS is indeed that not only are the instructors incredibly passionate about their work, but the teaching staff are also incredibly passionate and always willing to dedicate time. That being said, we do have a union. We do, and Carlos talked about that a little bit yesterday as well. Here's another facet of success, which I briefly touched on in the previous sentence, which is a co-teaching team. So over the past few semesters, we have had two faculty instructors, often from different departments, computer science and statistics, to teach this large course together. And with that different, like with that difference of ideas, comes actually a better course overall. So uh, Joey Gonzalez and Andrew Gray taught uh, last year computer science and statistics. Alvin Wan, a PhD student, uh, actually has now graduated, and Fernando Perez taught together last semester. And then spring, this past semester, uh, Josh Hug and I taught. We are both in computer science, but we both have a, a teaching background. Here's another example of a co-teaching type of a model. We actually have a textbook as well, which is, uh, which is uh, in development and actually available online. Uh, Deborah Nolan is involved in this, is a, uh, actually retired from the, the Faculty of Statistics, um, but also worked with computer scientists and PhD students as well. Actually, one of them is a cognitive scientist right now at UCSD. So what's next? Well, we would love to balance theory of practice. And so with that comes other courses probability, inference, and decision-making. We'd also like students to consider the data context. So again, this course is really about the real-world applications and the real-world tools, and that sort of engineering and statistical life cycle. Other courses like human context and ethics and the domain emphasis courses do teach a lot of that context that students would need uh, once they graduate UC Berkeley. And how do we build a new culture of computing that complements and enhancing our other computing majors? This is mostly through the teaching assistants that we have, as well as the graduate students that take our course. And so with that, I'll close. Thank you very much. It's exactly 12 o'clock. I did it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs>